for 2020. Can you believe that we're gonna say goodbye to 2019? Five, four, three, two, one. Happy, Happy New Year, Singapore! The end of 2019. Singapore joins nations around the globe to usher in a new decade. The next 10 years promise a bright future. But what comes next shocks the world. Singapore has confirmed its first case of the Wuhan virus. Singapore has reported 49 new COVID-19 cases today. This brings the national tally to 23,822. The epidemics in South Korea, Italy, Iran and Japan are its greatest concern. Health authorities around the globe battle the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The situation was unprecedented where globally, you know, all borders closed within just a couple of weeks. The global economy has virtually ground to a halt. Tens of millions of jobs have been lost. It is, in fact, the most dangerous crisis humanity has faced in a very long time. As the virus continues to rage today, this is the story of Singapore's battle to keep its borders open and the fight for our future. My name is Daniel Chan. I'm a taxi driver for 24 years. I like this job. I like to go around Singapore. I like to meet people. And this is our rice bowl. Daniel is one among nearly 16,000 taxi drivers in Singapore. Together with private hire drivers, they channel millions of passengers in and out of Changi Airport every year. If five trips a day, one or two trips will be at airport. When China happened with this COVID-19, a few customers tell me, oh, we are so small, definitely will be affected by this COVID-19 already. Because of this crisis, I really struggle. Because no flight coming in already. Sometimes you have to wait one or two hours. Even though one or two hours, you will can't see customers coming up from the departure hall. It's very difficult. But now no airport, so low already, no nowhere to go. For decades. Changi Airport has been Singapore's gateway to the world. Moving goods, investments, people and ideas. Being connected globally was key to Singapore's prosperity and survival. But in late March 2020, the pandemic forced authorities to do the unthinkable. Starting 11.59pm tomorrow night, short-term visitors will no longer be allowed to enter or transit through Singapore. Changi becomes a ghost of its former self. But as a globally connected city, it is almost impossible to keep the borders shut airtight. Even with the strictest travel restrictions in place, Changi sees over 25,000 travellers passing through its halls in April 2020. Large numbers of these travellers were citizens and long-term residents who were allowed to return home. It's a certainty that among these thousands, at least a few of them would have been infected with COVID-19. These people put healthy airport travellers at risk. A plan is needed and fast. At the early stage uh, last year, we started to segment different passengers based on the different uh, risk profile. 
High risk passengers upon arrival, they are held within the gate hole room and processed within the gate hole room and then escorted in badges through the terminal for their immigration clearance in a separate processing counters. Also at risk from exposure are the thousands of operational workers and immigration officers keeping the airport running. We had to actively work the ground. We brought NCID to uh, the aircraft because in the context of uh, cleaning an aircraft, there could be a potential risk of uh, fomites on board the aircraft where a cleaner may get infected if there is insufficient protection. We implement a very uh, stringent PPE requirement, wearing full PPE to clean the aircraft in that kind of uh, environment is actually very onerous and very, very stressful right for the worker. PPE requirements extend to workers in direct contact with high-risk travellers. Despite the strict measures at Changi and a regime forcing travellers to stay home for up to two weeks, an influx in people causes a spike in community cases. That outbreak was started from the middle of March 2020 and it was actually seeded by travellers returning from Europe, returning from North America back into Singapore that resulted in the circuit breaker being imposed. Nearly two months later, the nation emerges from lockdown. COVID numbers appear to be under control. Singapore's economy has been battered. Changi needs to get back to business and fast. Changi is a link to the world for us. So keeping our borders closed, we are slowly strangling ourselves. June 2020 brings a silver lining. Changi is given permission to handle transit passengers. By July, monthly passenger numbers jump threefold compared to two months before. Welcome to Singapore, as we need to keep Singapore bound passengers and transit passengers separated. All passengers, please remain seated. Thank you. As infection rates in Singapore drops in late 2020, Changi Airport finds itself with an unexpected competitive advantage in the transit arena against its Middle Eastern counterparts. If you were transiting in these Middle East places, you will end up having to do a quarantine when you arrive in the UK. But if you actually travel through Singapore, you don't have to do that because of how well Singapore has kept uh, COVID under control. So a lot of the, the travellers potentially from Australasia wishing to go back to Britain, they would then choose Singapore. So in that sense, Singapore became more of a convenient option. Singapore's a transit hub that's not just for air travel. In the early days of the pandemic, its role as a maritime hub comes into sharp focus as borders shut worldwide, sparking a crisis at sea. Everyone was quite shocked. You just saw all the doors closing around you, all, all the ports. The biggest psychological effect for me was you couldn't see an end to it. You didn't sign up for this sort of what felt like a, an unwanted prison sentence, an unjustified prison sentence. Singapore is an international shipping hub. And when the pandemic hit in early 2020, our sea lanes proved vital in importing and exporting goods. But maintaining this maritime network comes with a heavy price. Sailors work around the clock. Exhausted, isolated and stranded at sea. The longer you stay out there, the more fatigue you get physically. And the hours start to add up, the, the weeks and months start to add up. All that impacted the mental health. During the height of the COVID-19 uh, crisis last year, we were flooded with emails for help. When you read those emails, you start to realise it has been extremely painful for all of them. They can't go home. We have rights as human beings. We have a family of our own. We have a life to get back to. 
Typically, sailor contracts range from four to six months. But since the pandemic, many have been at sea for up to 19 months. Many countries do not allow seafarers to disembark from their ships for fear of importing the virus from them. In the beginning of the pandemic, the International Maritime Organization estimates there were 200,000 seamen stranded at sea. This number rose to 400,000 by the end of 2020. Operating a ship in the open oceans are quite stressful. You're looking at an enclosed space. You're limited to the deck or to where you are at. You can't go anywhere else. Can you imagine that mental stress and that frustration? Not being able to contact your loved ones, your child or your wife. You're not really thinking about your work anymore. It's very important in our job that you concentrate on what you're doing because things can happen very fast in this industry and people can get hurt. episode where the ship has sailed in Singapore and the captain said to the company, get me off the ship. I am not going to do any more sailing. I am sick and tired. I want to get home. Pre-COVID, many people took them for granted. 90% of the world's trade goes by sea. Singapore and many countries, we receive all our essential supplies and goods from ships. But ships don't move by themselves. You need crew to operate them. Bernard Lim works for the Ministry of Transport. On top of making sure Singapore's transportation networks, air, land and sea, remain safe and secure. The problem of sea crew change, or how Singapore can allow seafarers to disembark safely, became a part of his job. During COVID, many ports and airports were closed. Internationally, this became not only a major economic and trade problem, but it was also a humanitarian crisis. And therefore, we stepped up and we said, let's try to help find a solution to enable crew change. Bernard and his team form a multi-agency work group, bringing together different shipping organisations, including the Maritime and Port Authority, or MPA. Our priority here is to make sure that we do the crew change in a safe manner. The crew will not just come down from the ship and walk to the airport. Kelton has over 15 years of experience as a seafarer before joining MPA three years ago. But even with the depth of his experience, drawing up a crew change plan was a challenge. There wasn't any guidebooks available in the world and it's actually a blank piece of paper where we started. when COVID-19 was first reported in China. One of the first things we did was to organise and coordinate with multi-agency effort to evacuate Singaporeans in Hangzhou as well as Wuhan. Those experiences were important because it allowed us to build knowledge and understanding of what we needed to do, to draw upon the experiences of the different agencies to transport people coming into Singapore safely we had very good advice from our colleagues from the Ministry of Health on the health perspective to protect the people that were coming in and to protect the people around them and also the community. And now the question is, could we adapt a plan for crew change in this area? To minimise contact with the local Singapore community, crew completing their contracts are bubble wrapped from ship to plane using dedicated transport. And crews waiting for their plane home due to limited flights are housed in secure facilities for up to three days. When we successfully carry out the first crew change, a team of us actually went down to oversee the whole operations until we sent him off to the airport. And, and it was a happy moment, although it was very late, 2 a.m., because there was a flight from Kiwa. <laughs> But getting weary crew back onto dry land is only half the problem solved. The other half is securing fresh crew to take over from those leaving the ships. We try to capture any possible undetected infections even before they arrive in Singapore. That's the key thing itself. 
As an example, if I am the crew, during that 14 days, I am subjected to go through an antigen rapid test and PCR test, and 24 hours before I'm supposed to fly, I have to go through a fit for travel medical screening. And at the same time, a very last minute ART test to make sure that I am clean. Then, I get on the flight. So, ayan, ready na ako. Yung gamit ko, ito na. Before that, bago lumabas dito sa uh, pintuan ng uh, room ko, I need to wear my uh, PPE. Ganito ang magiging uh, itsura ko. Pag alis dito sa hotel, hanggang doon sa paglabas namin sa Singapore Airport, yung PPE na to must be wear at all times. After the crews land in Changi, they're bubble wrapped in the same manner, using dedicated transport from the plane to their ship. It feels good. Whenever we see a crew signing on, we feel happy for him because he's, he can earn money to go for his family. And whereas those on board, they can actually get to go home. We actually receive emails from the crew and master with a photo of their family. Thank you for helping me to get home. So that was actually really quite touching. Singapore now facilitates up to 300 crew changes a day, with crew rotations at its peak hitting three quarters of the pre-COVID rate. The seafarers and the shipping industry carry over 90% of the world's goods. If shipping stops, then we have a problem. The energy that we are using, the clothes that we wear, the food that we are seeing in the supermarkets, without that, I think all our goods and services will be extremely expensive. Seafarers play a very important role, and it's time for us to take care of them. While seafarers get a solution to maritime isolation, another group faces the fight of their lives. Once again, Bernard and his team are called on to solve another pandemic-generated challenge. We were approached by the Bone Marrow Donor Program to see if we could help because despite the COVID-19 situation and the reduction of international flights, it was still important to try to save lives. COVID restrictions placed the lives of leukemia and myeloma patients in grave danger. 2,000 suffer from these blood cancers in Singapore. The only cure is a bone marrow transplant. But the odds of finding a match are incredibly low. The Singapore Marrow Registry that we have today stands at only about 110,000 as compared to having 37 million donors globally. When we look for a matched donor, we do a global search from the start. Taiwan is one of our good, reliable sources because of the close anticity for Chinese patients especially. When a compatible bone marrow donor is found, it must reach the patient in under 48 hours. But with daily flights into Changi slashed by over 80%, stem cell delivery is challenging to the extreme. Because of the many restrictions that have been imposed on international travel, including restrictions at the airport, if we wanted to facilitate the movement of the bone marrow specimens, then it was necessary to come up with a special procedure for them. Why? because there is a need for expediency. Stem cells, when harvested, have to be infused into the patient within 72 hours. If not, the quality drops and the patients will be affected. There were a number of constraints, for example, flight connections and timing. About a week or so before, where our team and the relevant agencies would communicate and coordinate when would the specimens be required in the airport, when would the couriers be arriving, and how and where would we do the transfer. In some cases, the concern was if the flights got cancelled, then what do we do? So we had to come up with contingency arrangements. Open borders is so important. It affects our mission of saving life. During this pandemic, we facilitated with the support of MOT a total of 21 transfer, and that means 21 lives saved. With every pandemic-triggered problem, 
Changi must rise to the challenge, keeping sea lanes moving, saving lives, and now reuniting families. My name is Steve and I'm a chiropractor and I've been practicing in Singapore for the last 12 years. When the pandemic hit, Steve Chon was cut off from his family. My parents stay in Auckland, New Zealand. So on 5th of February this year, I had to go back. My father was permanently ill. If not now, I didn't know when else I could see him. On the 28th of February, I flew back into Singapore again. Steve records his arrival at Changi Airport. By February 2021, most overseas travelers are considered high risk. They must quarantine for 14 days. But visitors from New Zealand and Brunei are low risk, so they're spared quarantine on arrival. So Steve was surprised by how easily he could mingle in the transit area with other passengers who would go into quarantine after leaving the airport. We could have easily come in contact with other transiting passengers or arriving passengers from higher risk countries, pilots and cabin crew who are flying out and arriving. And that whole passageway, which was quite a bit of a walk in Terminal 3, it wasn't really closely monitored. So much so, that Steve was mistaken for a passenger coming from Germany, which in February was still listed as a higher risk country. You arrived from Munich? Uh, it's New Zealand. Under the rules in effect in February 2021, all travellers coming into Singapore need to take a COVID-19 test upon arrival. Do the test over there. there. Ah, okay. Those from higher risk countries are then transported by the authorities to their quarantine hotels. But a traveller like Steve, coming from a low-risk country, could walk out to take his own transport home to wait for his test result. Thank you, thank you. Can go, huh? Yeah. Everything is very well managed and contained. A lot of the staff were wearing the face mask and the face shield. So those little things made me feel extra safe. And measures at Changi were clearly working. Singapore barely had any community cases for months. But it's not to last. In just two months' time, the airport will face a deadly new enemy that tests its pandemic procedures to the limit. We are the first line of defence for Singapore for travellers coming into the country. My name is Sally Hin. I'm a team leader at Terminal 3 Arrival Immigration Hall. Since the start of this pandemic, Sally Hin's job has taken on a new level of risk. The general sentiment that I gather from my officers is the fear that they have is from the inherent risk that their job poses. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, our roles has expanded. We are essentially ensuring that the travellers coming in meet our health requirements in Singapore. These health requirements may include a negative pre-departure COVID-19 test, an entry approval from Singapore authorities, proof of overseas vaccination, and a serology test to confirm that they have COVID-19 immunity. But all that extra work is making it possible for Changi and Singapore's globally connected economy to crawl back to life. By June 2020, transit passengers are allowed back into Changi. Human traffic begins to climb. From a low of 24,000 in May 2020, monthly passengers jumped sixfold by January 2021. On the 28th of February, I flew back into Singapore. I was expecting the airport to be completely empty, like a scene from a zombie movie, and with all the shops closed and everything hoarded up. 
but it was actually quite the opposite. It still felt very warm, and then all the shops were open. It almost felt like pre-COVID times. Flying in from Auckland Airport was complete opposite of Changi Airport. All the shops were all hoarded up, and restaurants, it's all closed. Night and day difference, really. In January 2021, Singapore initiates a mass vaccination drive. All 37,000 frontline workers in the aviation and maritime sectors will be jabbed. The vaccination exercise that the ICA officers went through reassured that they are protected from the virus. But just as Singapore is moving towards better days, disaster strikes. The first case was detected last Wednesday, an 88-year-old cleaner who was fully vaccinated. On 5th May 2021, a cleaner at Terminal 3 tests positive for COVID-19. In less than a month, over 100 people are infected. These include airport workers with no previous contact with passengers. And infections start to soar. Adding to the cluster are the 13 new cases reported on Friday, making it the largest active one currently. Our ultimate fears came true. This is something that we thought could potentially happen, and it did happen. It was after my night shift. I had just come back from work. They had this really sombre tone. They just asked me, Hi, are you Ahmad Salihin? You are being served with a quarantine order today, and the transport will fetch you soon. The next day, I was already moved to the quarantine facility. Things were moving very fast. Salihin and his team had close contact with an ICA officer who tests positive. On the first day of Hari Raya, Salihin must quarantine alone. Am I going to test positive? Am I next? This is the fundamental fear and concern that all of officers have. At the start of Changi's outbreak, the majority of infections are ground workers. They include cleaners, security and immigration officers. Public health physician Dr Vernon Lee opens an investigation into the Changi cluster. An epidemiological investigation is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. At the start, you only have one piece. It's very difficult to understand what even the whole picture looks like. In the first few days of the investigation, we weren't quite sure where the introduction occurred. Dr. Lee and his team identify two cases that reveal a vital clue. On 8th May, two officers from different parts of Terminal 3 test positive. The first case is an aviation officer who screens departing and transiting passengers. But the second case leaves the investigators scratching their heads. He's a safety coordinator with zero passenger contact. This made us sit back and wonder. That was when we actually did further investigation, wider ring of testing, and uncovered more cases along the way. One of the new infections is an 18-year-old female student from Victoria Junior College. Through this student, the team discover a valuable piece of evidence. She went to the Kopitiam Food Court in Terminal 3. The team identified that the two early cluster cases, the aviation officer and safety coordinator, also visited the same food court. These two individuals had actually gone to the Terminal 3 Basement 2 Kopitiam to purchase food. And these are areas where the masks would be off during meals, where there would be potential interaction with different people coming from different parts of the airport. This investigation breakthrough triggers new concerns. When we were seeing the Changi cluster unfold, there were a few surprises. The first surprise was the speed of the outbreak, that it was happening very quickly. 
the genetic testing showed that this cluster was due to the Delta variant. And the Delta variant has been shown to be more transmissible. It could spread more easily, especially in areas where there are a lot of people in close proximity, like Changi Airport. The Delta variant is a viral game changer. It first emerges from India in December 2020. It's highly contagious and quickly crosses borders around the world. Singapore's first case is detected on 26 February 2021. When we had our first Delta cases, nowhere in the world uh, was there adequate information to know how much of concern it was because it was not even classified at that time as a variant of concern. In order to understand what exactly happened at Changi, I think it's useful to think about the transmissibility of the Delta variant. The coronavirus that emerged in January 2020, the first version that we saw that came out from Wuhan, it has a reproductive number of three. Anyone who is infected will go on to infect three other persons. Those three will infect another nine people. Those nine in the third round of infection will infect another 27 new people. So it goes from one to three to nine to 27. The Delta variant is much more transmissible. Each time a person is infected, he or she can go on to spread to another eight people. Eight to 64. And in the third round, 64 to 512. So if we look at just three cycles, the Delta variant is almost 19-fold difference. The Delta variant is more transmissible because mutations allow it to bind better with human cells. These infected cells also carry a higher viral load. With the original COVID-19 strain, every time you cough or sneeze, you might expel one million viral particles. With the Delta strain, this expulsion rises to 10 million, greatly increasing rates of airborne transmission. And there's another game changer. The Delta variant has a short incubation of one to two days, compared to the original strain of five to 10 days. It's faster, meaner, and more effective than ever before. By April 2021, this new strain ravages India. India reported the world's highest daily COVID-19 tally for the second day in a row, with more than 332,000 new infections. Several hospitals have had to close their doors to new patients because they've run out of medicine, beds and oxygen. On 1st of May, Singapore blocks the entry of long and short-term pass holders from India and its surrounding countries, while Australia bars citizens coming back from India. Singapore leaves its doors open to citizens and PRs. But this return comes with a condition. All arrivals must test negative within the last 48 hours before they arrive in Changi Airport. In the past, certain people with very close ties to our residents here, certain leeway, simply because we wanted them to be able to come back home whenever they wish to. But unfortunately, Delta strain came along and then we've had mega clusters one after another in order to reduce the burden for ourselves. Until we can get on top of things, it's difficult to have that leeway. But even with the new measures, the Changi cluster continues to grow. By May 9th, the Ministry of Health decides on a new course of action. There were 9,000 workers at the airport. They may have interacted with each other, whether it be at their place of work or at common areas such as Kopitiam. So we decided we had to test all the workers just to be sure of the extent of transmission and to be sure that there are no leaks in the airport. Mass testing is nothing new to Changi. Since October 2020, all airport staff are tested regularly. Those with greater exposure to incoming passengers are tested every seven days, others every 14 days. This process is called Rostered Routine Testing, or RRT. But in some of the new cases detected in Changi, nearly a month passed 
before they were last tested. Why did this happen? Turns out, in January 2021, the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore announced its cutting RRT by half. Those on a seven-day testing period will be reduced to 14, and those on a 14-day testing period will be reduced to every month. We didn't just simply take the decision to reduce without making sure that these people are protected. Most of these people are vaccinated. That is one layer of protection. And as more of our frontline workers became vaccinated, it is possible then for vaccinated individuals to have their RRT cycles lengthened or prolonged because of this protection. What we didn't expect was that the Delta variant can actually increase the chance of what we call vaccine breakthrough. Meaning, a person who's been vaccinated can still go on to be infected. Out of more than 100 positive cases in the Changi cluster, 43 are vaccinated with at least one dose. Before the outbreak goes out of control, we consulted the various agencies and decided to close Changi Airport and Jewel to members of the public. The airport remains open for travel, but Changi's terminals are shut to those without an air ticket. That, I think, had a big psychological impact on the locals here because just a few weeks ago, they were advertising all these activities and promotions, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's actually off limit. It saps a little bit of the confidence the public might have. After his preventive quarantine, ICA officer Salihin returns to frontline work after testing negative for COVID-19. Coming back after my quarantine order, we didn't know how much it could impact us in our lives every day. We tried to assure our families, even though we are at risk every day, we still have the protection measures in place. As Singapore assesses its Delta variant defences, tighter border controls hit another key part of the economy. Construction, the marine and process sectors, or CMP. We have seen a lot of project delays. Even HDB, BTO projects have been pushed back by a few quarters, if not a few years. As far as the marine and process sectors are concerned, the dependence on foreign uh, workforce continues to be an issue, especially now that the borders remain largely closed. Since the start of the pandemic, workers return home at the end of each contract. But fresh batches of workers are barred from entering. The number of CMP work permit holders plummets by over 15%, causing havoc to Singapore's economy. South Asia has been one of our traditional sources of human capital and labour. Essentially, if you restrict numbers from the South Asian region, projects that are already ongoing here in Singapore, which have a timeline to be completed, there may be potential penalties or damages. The crux is we also do need to save as many viable companies as we can. With projects grinding to a halt, something must be done. A new pilot scheme is launched. It brings workers back to Singapore in small batches, a few hundred at a time. The scheme integrates overseas training with on-arrival testing and stay-home notices to ensure the risk of infection is kept to a minimum. Projects are slowly coming back to life. the Changi cluster is eventually contained, closing with a total of 108 cases. The country survives the scare. But the global race to reopen borders has begun. Can Singapore keep up with the pack? With vaccination rates rising in the developed world, the race to reopen borders is now on. Singapore remains cautiously a step behind, 
ensuring its borders are resilient to the Delta variant. Since the Changi outbreak, new steps are taken to reduce the risk of infection at the airport. Currently, only Terminals 1 and 3 are operational. They are divided into three zones. Zone 3 is the open check-in area before the departure gates. Zone 2 is the central transit area where passengers enter after passing through the gates. Zone 1 is the arrival hall and baggage claim area. This is the highest risk zone. Zone 1 staff wear the highest level of PPE and have their own dedicated toilets, dining and rest areas. Upon arrival, passengers from high-risk countries are now escorted to Terminal 4. Here, they are processed for immigration and tested upon arrival. From Terminal 4, they're then transported via private chartered buses to a quarantine facility. In short, passengers with different risk profile, they are not allowed to mix freely as they are being processed separately through the arrival journey at Changi Airport. Steve Chan experiences Changi's stringent new measures firsthand in July 2021. So I'm at the airport at Terminal 3 and only the travelling passengers are allowed to come into the buildings. This Singapore resident is returning to New Zealand for good, to be with his family after his father passes away. The whole terminal is actually quite empty, uh, which is very different to the way things looked back in February when I left. Back in February, Steve flew out from Singapore to visit his ailing father. Steve is now in a unique position to compare the airport before and after the Changi cluster. So it looks like they separated the pathway between arriving passengers and departing passengers. Uh, the only downside is uh, I can't use the travelator to get to my gate, which looks like it's way down there. As Steve flies out of Singapore, Melissa Yambao flies in from the Philippines. Melissa is a permanent resident and she sees Changi from the perspective of arriving passengers. From the planning, I saw more staff waiting to help segregating the passengers that are arriving in Singapore and those that are transiting. When I got to immigration, I actually saw quite a number of staff that helped passengers, pointing them to where they should go, uh, depending on where they came from. We were actually cordoned off to one side of the airport. Everything is marked properly and segregated properly, and you can't even mingle <laughs> with others at the airport. Having gone through three airports, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the strictest. I would say Singapore is the most organized. Every step makes sense. With billions of dollars invested in Changi, it's essential for Singapore's economy that this airport remains world class. If you cannot keep Changi safe, nobody's going to come through Changi Airport, right? I think the competition is real. If you look at some of the other airport hubs in the world, some of them have been quite quick on the uptake. So they are uh, coming in very close. For the first time in eight years, Changi slips from the top spot as the world's best airport. It places third, behind Qatar's Hamad International Airport in Doha and Japan's Haneda Airport in Tokyo. Changi has a good uh, reputation. I think it's not losing its shine, but Singapore might lose some of its shine as a tourist attraction. And Changi would concurrently lose its shine as a place where tourists arrive in large numbers. August 2021 brings new hope. Singapore announces the lifting of quarantine for all travelers from Hong Kong and Macau 
and for vaccinated travelers from Germany and Brunei in September. Travelers only need to subject themselves to COVID testing. The faster we can reopen to overseas uh, travelers, I think that would be a very, very positive boost to the Singapore economy. A hundred travellers taking the first flight from Frankfurt to Singapore have landed at Changi Airport. I still can't believe that I just walked out of the airport, just have to self-isolate at home. Once the swab test comes back, I'm free to go out and about. So it's really, it feels like freedom suddenly comes back. <laughs> this is a new chapter in Singapore's border control as we learn to live with the new COVID normal.